let's see, I'm going to go ahead. Um, I'm going to pause here for just a moment so I can start the recording or oh, it looks like Yvonne, you already did. Perfect. So again, welcome to active learning in large classes. And now that we're kind of through with our, our tech check, I think we can just dive into the agenda and take a look at uh, what we have in mind for you today. So we are going to start off um, just with a few rounds of introductions and icebreakers. Uh, we have some questions for you that we wanted to ask. And then we're going to look at some of the different aspects of active learning um, and how that affects these large roster classes. So uh, we're going to kind of identify some of the important pieces of active learning. We're going to give you some very specific strategies uh, for what you can do in your class. Uh, we, we like to give you some actual contextual examples of, of things you can do to engage your students. And then uh, we're going to take a look at how you can plan uh, for active learning. You know, as you start to develop your course. And then of course, we'll dive into the final Q&A and wrap up session, but we're a small group today. So if you have any questions along the way, uh, you know, please feel free to communicate whether you're more comfortable with the text chat or if you just wanna turn on your microphone. So your choice out. Um, so I think we can just go ahead and let's start with a, a few icebreakers. So. Let us know. Um, again, you can hop on the microphone or you can type away, but what is it that you teach? Um, what is your best large class strategy? I'm sure you've already come up with some ideas that are working for you. Um, and then also let us know what do you struggle with the most? Uh, because there are different challenges associated with these large classes. So I'll pause here and anyone can dive in. I'd be happy to start. Um, my name is Alicia Perisky, and I'm an assistant professor in the Department of Political Science. So I teach mainly comparative politics um, and a variety of and methods classes associated with political science. Um, definitely, I would say with large, my best large class strategy uh, would be integrating you know, moments for students to engage in discussion. And I find that some of the easiest ways to do that is to give them opportunities to talk to someone next to them in a small group before opening it up to a broader discussion, um, which I think can sometimes, you know, help students, um, particularly those who might be nervous to engage in discussions in large classes. Um, but I find that um, particularly in large classes, it can be difficult to ensure that all students get equal opportunities for such engagement and, and discussion in a larger group. And so I would love to hear other people's strategies for, for dealing with engaging students who might be quiet and, and less engaged in larger classes. Great, thank you so much. Um, you know, and I was just curious here, are you teaching primarily, would you say, face-to-face -face right now? I, I know our dynamics for our classrooms are so diverse at the moment. Uh, so right now, actually, I'm on modified duties due to parental leave. I have a wee one at home. Um, so I'm actually not teaching at the moment. Um, but in the fall, I'll be teaching one, two classes, both face to face. Um, one's a grad class, so it's a bit smaller. But the other is an African politics class, and that'll be a larger kind of in-person undergraduate class. Oh, wonderful. So you'll be planning actually for upcoming courses. Wonderful. Thank you. I will be, yeah. Fantastic. And Marilyn, what about you? Um, hi, everyone. Yeah, so uh, my name is Marilyn and my situation is a little unique because um, I was a TA for spring 2021. That was like my last um, TA um, class. Uh, and so I haven't really had the opportunity to teach anymore. But when I did teach, um, I was um, for the nonprofit center and sociology. So um, I helped with uh, methods classes and um, nonprofit. Um, and I would say my best large class strategy is to just, well, because I was online, so I would always make sure to like look at everyone's faces. So I don't know how, if you can do that as good like in person, but um, that always helped me because you could kind of like gauge what people were thinking just by looking at their face, like if they were getting it. So just like really pay, paying attention to people's expressions. 
Um, and I guess my biggest challenge with a large class was just making sure that everyone was um, like truly understanding because I feel like sometimes people will nod along, um, which is why I think I like focus so much on the expressions. Um, so yeah, just like making sure that people like don't have any questions and like um, aren't afraid to like speak up if they don't understand something. Great, thank you so much. You know, I, I love talking about the different modalities that we have to work with. I, I think with this pandemic, we're kind of in a state of constant fluctuation. So, you know, these are good strategies and making eye contact is definitely a, a way to build that you know, personal connection with your students. But I, I know that a lot of instructors have struggled with this uh, recently because in an online setting, um, sometimes, you know, due to equity issues, they would turn off the webcams. And so we were looking for other ways to engage with our students and, and make sure that they they were understanding and comprehending the material. Um, and, and sometimes, you know, if students don't ask questions, uh, we have to figure out how to, to test their knowledge. So I think these are all, you know, valid concerns and strategies uh, that you're coming up with here. So thank you. All right. Well, let's, um, oops. Sorry, I, I froze here. Let me go back. I think we can just start with looking at the importance of our active learning, um, you know, taking a look at, at different course structures, uh, what they mean. When we look at a, a large class, um, hmm, I, I see my uh, slide here has changed format a little bit. We we do have some of these um, problems that I, I think you've already, you know, started to, to hint at. There's this idea of, we may have a enormous workload when it comes to large rosters of students. And as a result of that, our students can often feel like they are um, a passenger in their own course. I, I do call it the passenger syndrome. I don't know if there's a, a better name for this uh, feeling, but they end up oftentimes feeling like they're isolated. Uh, they're not actively in charge of their own education. And so they're just supposed to sit there and kind of absorb things in a very uh, sponge-like mentality. And this can, uh, of course, cause stress both for the instructor who now has to grade a, lot, grade a large quantity of work from their students, uh, but it also stresses out the students because they have not made that connection either with their peers or with their coursework. Uh, and, and so it kind of becomes this cycle that keeps repeating over and over again. And so we're looking for ways um, that we can break this up and make it uh, something manageable, which is already one of the biggest challenges that we face when we have a large class. Um, and, and it seems to be a prevalent issue, as we said, in any of these modalities, whether that's face-to-face, -face, um, hybrid, or completely online. So we do have some strategies about this, um, but we also want to take a look at, you know, why we want to to change up our, our lesson plan. And it's not that lecturing versus active learning activities um, are, are better or worse, you know, we're, but they are different. And so we did find this chart that we thought, you know, did a nice job of dividing up the, the two primary differences here. So lectures should be incorporated into our, into our courses. We want to convey this new material to our students, um, but we also want to think about how much time we spend lecturing our students in a given class period. So again, the idea that the lecture material is relevant uh, is still you know, high on our list of priorities, um, but then we also have to think about how can we develop our students' skill level as well? Um, how can we get them to engage with that new content? So it's not one or the other, it's, it's a balance of both. And a large part of this also comes down to the role of the instructor. Historically speaking, a lot of instructors uh, were viewed kind of as gatekeepers of knowledge, right? Uh, they would present their material um, to large you know, rosters of students, and they were the ones who were in charge of the classroom. Uh, this is a, 
a very common example of how classrooms have worked throughout history, um, but there has been a more recent movement to um, look at teaching as more of a facilitator role. Um, and in this sense, we, we are not the gatekeepers. We do have important knowledge that we need to pass on to our students, uh, but we're going to facilitate the environment where they actually interact with this content. They can ask questions, they can experiment with it, um, and in doing so, they are more likely to retain that knowledge. So, as promised, we do have these uh, very specific strategies for engagement. We always like to give you an actual example of what this could look like in your course. And you know, as you said, you might be planning upcoming courses for either the summer or the fall. Um, so this is a good idea to kind of keep in mind as you go about setting up all of your different lesson plans. So the first part that I want to get to is to rethink group work. Um, and again, one of the most common hurdles that we encounter with these large classes is how do I manage that workload as an instructor? And if I start to give out group work, how am I going to be able to handle all of the grading? So there are two parts to this. The first part is not Everything that you do in your course has to be a graded assessment. So you can also think of group work as a group activity, um, which I will get to momentarily. And the other part is you can think of group work as an opportunity uh, for you to actually condense some of your, your grading workload as an instructor. So when you think of groups for your students, try to think about how you would like them to engage is the first part. Uh, do you want to assign the groups? Or do you want to have um, a pre-selected list of topics and you ask your students to pick the topic um, that's of most interest to them and so then they can self-enroll in a group? Or do you prefer to do the kind of random selection, like drawing straws? Um, so this is kind of the first part. How, how are you going to get your students to interact with each other? And if you're not sure which strategy would work best for you, I would suggest um, trying one strategy and, and then at a future date, try a different strategy and compare notes. Um, but the idea here is we do want our students to interact with each other, to talk amongst each other, um, but we also want them to, to think about new groups as opposed to maybe just who they're sitting next to in a large class. So that's part of it. Uh, the other part is the grading component, which I, I know I already touched on. It's a large concern and a valid concern for a lot of instructors. Uh, but a, a nice way to tackle this is to make sure that part of your group projects um, are also self-graded by the students. There should be uh, a grading opportunity where they can assess their peers' contributions to the to the group. And a nice way to do this is you can just set up kind of a, like a grading rubric for your students and you just ask them to insert the names of each of their group members at the end of the, the group submission. You can have them email their their rating of their peers' contributions directly to you so that it's a private, um, you know, contribution, it's a private conversation. And, you know, at this stage, I do also want to talk about a particular tool that you can use. So um, as you may be aware, NIU is moving to a shift where we'll only be using Blackboard Ultra. And one of the tools that they have integrated is this idea of grading as a group. So you can, if everybody contributed equally, uh, you can give the same score to each of your students, but they also have in the grade book now an option where you can adjust the scores uh, based on individual student uh, contributions. And you can also insert specific commentary and feedback to individual students. Uh, and you don't have to worry that your feedback is, is being viewed by the entire group. You can send it just to one specific student from your grade book, uh, which will also, I think, cut down uh, dramatically on the amount of time that you spend you know, grading and replying to your students. 
So I know there was a lot to, to pack in there, um, but these are all different strategies and tools that you can use uh, to manage your time wisely with such a large class. And the other uh, piece of this is to consider mandatory meetings for your students. So if we do group projects, you can require your students to set up a mandatory um, office hour appointment with you. And now you can meet with the small groups one-on-one. -on -one. If you don't feel that there's enough time for this or there's too many groups, another alternative would be to set aside the last, you know, say 10 minutes of class where you meet with a specific group. So if you have a, uh, pardon me, a 60 minute long class, 50 minutes you could spend with the entire uh, class and then the last 10 minutes, um, you can just say that group one is going to meet with me today and group two is going to meet with me next week, et cetera. Um, and so you'll you'll build an agenda for these meetings where you can discuss their progress on the said project. You can discuss what piece each person is contributing um, and you can offer them an opportunity to ask you questions or, or to clarify anything that might be confusing. All right. And so then our, our next option um, is something that we call just-in-time teaching, which I, I know is kind of a familiar term, but there are different interpretations of what just-in-time teaching can look like. For large classes, what you may want to do is you can ask your students to submit some sort of a problem-solving activity to you electronically before the start of class. Um, so you can give them a sample scenario and see if they can figure it out, if they can solve the problem, um, and they'll turn this in before you meet as a class. During that next class period, you can give them some more information that may contribute to uh, their problem solving activity. And you have a couple of different options here. You could either ask them to try to resolve that uh, same problem now that you've given them some additional information. Or for uh, the sake of this large class, you might invite them to come into your session, whether this is virtual or face to face. Um, and you can divide them up into groups. Um, after having reviewed their answers from that first submission, you can put them into groups and see if they can solve a second problem uh, that's related to the first activity. And this is a great opportunity for you to see, you know, are your students exhibiting certain trends? Um, did they all, you know, have some similar answers or did they have some similar areas where they they stumbled and needed more work and can you divide them up into groups um, based on some of these trends that you've observed all right questions so far or should i move on nothing so far okay. for me thank you all right and I'm going to go ahead here and I, I will let uh, Yvonne go ahead. I know this is her next slide. Thank you, Megan. And the equity cards is another approach that you can use to integrate active learning in your courses, in your large classes. And it connects with what Megan was talking about in terms of she was talking about groups and how you could engage with the different groups. And with the equity cards, um, it's a focus on the individual students. And you can generate a class list and call on, just randomly call on people in an order from the cards. So maybe you'll download the list of people in the course and then randomly order them and then begin identifying them in random order in the in the course list that you generated. And that will help you to make sure that you're not focusing on just a few or if some of the students talk quite a bit in class and others don't, it helps you to be equitable in terms of who you're calling on and, and balancing the engagement across the whole group of students. And it helps students to feel that they are they're recognized 
in this process, it's important to use their names. And if you have the list of people in the class, then you can use their names and students feel like they're important and valued because you're calling on them by name. And it serves to increase engagement and active learning in the class. You could also have students select. So if you generated a, a list, maybe you'd print some cards or have students select, randomly select someone to for you to call on. And then from that, you would um, randomly have another student call on um, the next person. And it kind of ripples across the class. And it allows for building interest because students don't know for sure when they're going to be called on and they're more likely to be focused on what's going on if they think that they're going to be called on to share their perspectives. Okay, great. Okay, so Megan says that she has used that effectively. That's great. Thank you, Megan. It ensures broad class participation. It helps to reduce the likelihood of students disengaging during a class and it it provides a foundation for building that learning community feeling in the class which I I try to do that with each one of my courses build that community where they're constructing knowledge and engaging and actively working on things together and it can really be fun to watch and to see them construct knowledge and equity cards can help to facilitate that. And Alicia, I think you had mentioned that you had uh, you teach a large class, and you were looking for a way to be able to engage all the students. This this could be a simple way way to do that. And the next approach is called a cliffhanger lecture. And this approach is, is designed to help, help to build connections from one lecture to the next lecture, from one class period to the next class period. And you intentionally structure a topic to end at three quarters of the way before it would actually be completed. And you're thinking about not completing the topic within one class period, but completing three quarters of it in one class period. And then you can ask for students to brainstorm about next concepts, what you'll be talking about at the beginning of the next session. You can use that last quarter of the, the first session to review information that you covered in that three quarters of the way lecture. And then for the subsequent class period, you start that class period talking about the concepts that were brainstormed in the prior class period and connecting with that conversation and activities that you had in the prior class period. And that way, you have this continuous building of information and the students don't feel like each class period is distinct and doesn't have any connections with the next one. This clearly shows that the lectures and the information and the discussions have continuity. And you're building in that student conversation. They're brainstorming. They are asking uh, complex questions and trying to predict, possibly, what's going to be talked about in that next session. And it helps with connecting the topics quite a bit. And professors talk about challenges with students being able to understand how the concepts relate to other aspects of the course or to other courses in the curriculum. You could bring in um, connections with other courses in the curriculum when you're talking about courses that the students are, are taking. But that cliffhanger lecture and I was talking to my colleague Megan and she had indicated that 
in um, some of her English classes they had done that um, address uh, provide students three quarters of the story and then have students write the remaining parts of the story yeah, I, I think it's such an interesting um, approach. I think it may vary, you know, based on individual instructor preference or, or even maybe by discipline. Um, so yes, my background is in English and, and I primarily teach English composition, but also some developmental reading. And and this is a, an activity that we use quite a bit. Um, instead of just having a cliffhanger ending, you know, for a particular course, they might do a cliffhanger ending for a particular project. And, and so they'll give you, you know, three quarters of the information and you have to use your your knowledge um, and your creative abilities to fill in that last segment um, so so it is you know it it's a nice way for students to get creative um, but to also kind of solve if you will a, a riddle i don't know if anybody else has used it in a different context um, but but we used it a lot of times for for filling in narratives and and written um, kind of context. I, I would say creative writing, uh, but I've seen it for essays as well. Um, so I'm not sure what else other people have used it for, but I'd be curious to hear. And that's an interesting point that you raised, Megan, about a riddle, um, sort of um, a challenge and piques students' interest and that's going to also help with the with the engagement. Alicia, do you see how that might apply possibly in a political science class? Would that be something you might be able to use? I've been trying to think through whether that would be the case. And I mean, I can definitely see it, um, you know, Megan, as you're mentioning in English courses and others. And I think it might depend on the course um, partially and, and the maybe even the topics that we're covering, um, whether it would be a useful strategy. Um, because I really do like the idea of also giving students the kind of um, opportunity to finish it off in a, in a sense, as you're saying. Um, so definitely, I think something for me to think through how I might structure that in a way that would work for students. I did have a quick question. if. It's okay. Go ahead. Um, I was wondering with the equity cards, um, just how often you use this, at both of you in your experience. I can definitely see instituting this at the beginning of, of the year um, and then just wondering how you balance that with other forms of engagement in the class. So, you know, when you choose to, do you choose to use the cliffhanger or sorry, the equity cards rather for each engagement, you know, if you're asking a question or just some of them, or how do you, I guess, navigate that throughout the course? Does that make sense? Yes, it does. Well, one of the things that I do is have the whole course planned, and then I look at what I'm going to address and how I'm going to address it in each class session. And as you mentioned, Alicia, you use different techniques and if I was having a, a large class discussion, then the equity cards lend themselves to that. And the cliffhanger lends itself to um, you know, a story where maybe they can create their own ending. But what, what you need to think about is, and we're going to talk a little bit about this in a couple of slides, so, so just hold on a little bit. Because um, we're going to talk about the considerations that you need to keep in mind when you're deciding when to use one of these different techniques. So that probably will address your question. Go ahead, Megan. I had a different, you know, I, I think it is, uh, I love these discussions because we, we have so many different viewpoints for it. Um, I take a different approach. And um, I look at the equity cards or the equity cards concept as a great way for me to get to know my students. I think one of my hardest challenges with large classes is I can walk away from this course and feel like I don't know any of my students as individuals. Um, and that's something that I, 
I don't want to have happen. Um, so I use kind of the equity cards um, concept as frequently as possible. Um, I, I would try to instill that almost into every single course. And, and I've used it in different contexts. Uh, when it was a face-to-face -face course, I like to use this idea where students would come in um, and, and you would give them a number. And, um, you know, you, you pick like the first person um, that you want to call on, you know, in your class. And you could say, okay, um, Jane, I'm gonna call on you. And then um, you ask Jane to pick a number. Well, Jane doesn't know which of her peers is holding that number, but whoever number she calls on, they get to answer the next question. Um, and, and so it kind of spices up the dynamic of your course. Um, everybody is kind of on alert that they might be called on to contribute. So um, it, it's a great way for us to, to learn each other's names and to hear each other's voices. Uh, versus in an online context, I, I was a little bit more flexible with how my students wanted to interact. And um, you know whether they wanted to use the microphone or if they preferred the text chat, that was fine with me. Um, one of the things that I instilled was I, I've used, um, it's a virtual name generator. I don't know if you've ever seen these websites, but it's basically like a wheel of fortune and it, it spins and it lands on somebody's name. Um, and that's the person who gets to answer you know, the question being asked and, and they choose which modality they're comfortable with, um, but they do have to contribute. So, sorry for, for hugging the microphone, but um, it, it is one of those things that you can use frequently and often, and, and it will help uh, increase the, the amount of activity that you see being produced in these large classes. Thanks both, that's super helpful, and I can definitely see that particularly in an online learning context. So thank you both. Thank you, Megan. And I, okay, Marilyn, did you want to share something? Yeah, um, I just had a quick question, if that's okay. Um, this is kind of relating back to earlier about the group work. Um, and we can answer this at the end if it's getting in the way of the lecture, but I was just wondering, um, how do you like, I like the idea of group work. And I, when I was taught students, like I found that they really liked that. Um, but I know I see online sometimes students complaining about group work and like, like, so just like some strategies to motivate like the more reserved um, students to want to participate in group work and like get excited about it. Well, one of the things that you can do with group work to, to ensure that each student contributes is there there are ways to assign roles to um, students in the group or you could have a set of rules maybe someone needs to be the person who's going to present maybe someone needs to be the scribe and these different roles for the group you could give that list of roles to the group and have them decide who wants to be in what role the idea is that everyone has a role and and they're contributing and it balances out that some people are more comfortable speaking to others in the class or to people they don't know and things like that. And Megan, you touched on group work. Do you want to um, share your insights about that, please? Uh, sure. You know, part of what I like to do is um, I, I do also like to insert some sort of a group rotation. Um, they, they don't are they don't always stay in the same group. Um, they they get to go to different ones, um, either based on their interest or or just based on a random cycle that um, you know I implemented for that particular day. Um, and NIU faculty, I think they're getting pretty creative with um, how they can assign those roles that. Yvonne was talking about. So I've seen faculty who said, okay, whoever um, is the furthest away from NIU campus, you know, for a synchronous course session, uh, you're the scribe. And so what they've actually done is they've inserted this icebreaker activity. The students have to talk to each other. Where are you located? Oh, um, you know, and whoever is physically furthest away from from campus that day, they're they're the new scribe for that group. Um, if they switch and go to a new group as part of the rotation, uh, the scribe for for that group could be the the person with the smallest shoe size. Um, it, again, it, it kind of introduces this element of, of play, um, but it's also pushing students to 
have a conversation about you know where they are who has the biggest foot who has the smallest foot um but but it does actually push them just to to start talking and and once they get used to all of these different you know activities they'll, they'll come to expect it from you they they won't know what <laughs> which one you're going to implement that day um but but you're going to have a talkative course thank you megan that's that's terrific and the topics that are the suggestions that megan is sharing clearly help to build that community the connections between and among the students and as she said that that means your course the they'll be engaged, they'll be active, and, and they'll learn more. It'll, it'll be a deeper type of a learning. Okay, thank you. In the past, the pointer is another approach that you can use in a large, you could ask for volunteers, and you would place a, a complex or intricate detailed image on the screen, something that's you're going to address in the class that is, is complicated, has lots of different parts to it. And ask for volunteers, you have a, a laser pointer, and then you can say, okay, um, first person, come up to the uh, front of the class and point to either a, a section on this con or on this complicated image and Talk about why that's a key aspect of, of the theory that we're discussing today or of the scientific approach or the political situation in a certain country. And so that person would point to it and they would say, okay, well, the, the political situation in XYZ country is this and it's key to our discussion because of, of this. And then they could also ask questions about different aspects of this complex theory and concepts that you're discussing and they could say well you know I understand the origin of this situation I understand the key stakeholders but I don't really understand how they resolve this issue or, or I don't understand why it's still an issue uh, for these two countries or these two groups and then after you've gone through that discussion, the student passes the pointer to the next volunteer. And it's, it's similar to what Megan was talking about with the, with the cards or generating. You don't know who's going to be um, next. Um, the students could select people or the students could volunteer and it there's a dynamic thing that they're more their interest is peaked and it allows for student choice and it it helps get them moving which is important um, just not just planted on a chair in the lecture hall and it gives them the opportunity to clarify any concept concepts that they're not um, understanding at that point in time And Megan says it's a great concept mapping exercise. Give them a jumble of concepts to choose from. See how they organize the different pieces. Yes, yes, that's that's a great idea. And with the concept mapping, then the students have organized the ideas in certain ways, and you have this visual image. And then you can you can determine if the students have an understanding of how these different concepts fit together. And if, if their concept map shows that maybe they have um, a theory at the base of the bottom of the map that's supposed to be foundational for their concept map, but really when you have a clear understanding of what's going on in this particular exercise that you gave them, that particular theory came out of all these situations that are depicted on the concept map. So it'll give you an idea of, okay, I need to clarify this because they're thinking that this theory is the foundation and actually it emerged from the situation. And yes, great. And that when there's visuals, it helps because you're seeing it, you're hearing it, 
you're engaging with it and so that helps to deepen learning as well. Terrific, thank you. Thank you, Megan. And it's important that you plan for these active learning activities. We'll talk a little bit about how you can plan for these to help them be successful in your courses. And when you think about an active learning activity, it's important for you to, to first have an open and safe environment. And the, some of the different techniques we've talked about build that those relationships between and among students. They build that the discussions students feel comfortable sharing in this course. And, and that's important. And particularly in a large class where there's a possibility that they might not engage just because of the sheer size of it. It's important to set a goal for the activity and choose the right exercise. And Alicia asked about that earlier. In, in our resources that you're going to get after this session, there's an active learning cheat sheet. And basically, it's an infographic. And it shows these 10 different steps for getting started with active learning. And then for the third step, choosing the right exercise, it gives you suggestions about what you need to consider and how you would decide which activity is appropriate for this particular um, learning objective that you're trying to meet. And so you would consider things like the, um, the class size. You consider the student population. Are they freshmen who are first semester freshmen? Or are they second semester seniors? And what level of complexity would they be able to handle in relationship to this activity? Think about the time constraint, constraints. And we talked about groups. Is it appropriate to use small groups, pairs? Maybe it's um, someone earlier mentioned those small pairs discussions in a class. Think about are the chairs in this lecture hall, are they movable um, or not? And so if they're not movable, then you have students stand up or move around and things like that. And you want to think through these logistics considerations and the population and the, the topic and, and make sure that, OK, this this could be successful because it's it could be done in the time allotted. It fits with the student's level of knowledge. And it fits with the environment in which you're going to be teaching it. And then identify what you need to do to prep. And you can see on that, that screen, there's this particular professor has a lot of paper. They're color coding things. Maybe you need sticky notes. Maybe you need some kind of supplies. Maybe you need to give students some sort of handouts or post something in the Blackboard course that they need as maybe a template as a, a simple structure for the activity. And think about links to other aspects of the class elements. We talked about that with that cliffhanger. Um, I do a lot of active learning in my the courses that I teach, and I always bring Explain the activity in terms of, you know, we're talking about developing a research problem. How do you identify a research problem? What's, what's a good research problem? And then I would connect that with what we had talked about in, in the prior classes, what we're going to talk about in the future classes, and how it fits into their final projects for the course. And then they can see how what they're doing in this activity, it's deliberate. And it makes sense in terms of fitting it all together for that course. And think about how you're going to introduce the activity. And when I introduce the activities, I, I, I give some, um, some connection with the learning goals for the course. And I give an introduction, why are we doing this, and how it's going to help them with the learning goals of the course. And for instance, I'm teaching a qualitative research course this semester. And 
collecting data for qualitative research is often done through interviews, you might do focus groups, collecting documents, things like that, observing. And in the class, I have them actually conduct interviews, conduct observations, collect documents and artifacts. And then I explain to them, okay, this is what you would do if you were completing um, qualitative dissertation, things like that. And so they can see, okay, Dr. Johnson has introduced this activity and I can see that it connects with my, with the learning objectives of the course and with the, my objectives in my graduate program. And so then you also have buy-in from them. And planning the logistics, it's important to think through logistics because if, if you don't think through those, then there might be something fairly simple that wasn't done. Um, maybe the um, introduction, maybe you forgot to give an introduction about how this links with the learning objectives or with their career or academic goals. And then you might notice there's not as much buy-in and engagement if you do introduce it and show those alignments with the learning objectives for the course and there why it's relevant and important to the students, then you're likely to see a high lo higher level of engagement. And then think about how are you going to judge the success? And Megan was talking about earlier the grading and sometimes you have activities that maybe it's a formative type of activity where they're learning and it's low stakes, maybe it's worth a few points, or maybe it's not graded at all. But the point is that you are getting them engaged and that they are, into, they are working with that content and with people that are also in the class. And after you have thought through all those steps, then you're going to do this and take some notes about how it went. And what I do is I'll put, kind of make a, a simple time frame so that I can have an idea of, okay, I want the introduction to be, you know, maybe two minutes. I want the getting the groups together to take so many minutes. I want them to be engaged with this group for so many minutes, do a wrap up so that it's planned and then you can make sure that you can successfully complete it in, in the class session. And then when you're, you'll do it again with another class and then that next iteration, maybe you'll expand it, maybe you'll revise it a bit based upon what you learned in that first session. But, but I would recommend that you do think about how you're going to set it up and how you're going to carry it out. And this active learning cheat sheet will be very helpful with that. And then this is a simple lecture plan for active learning. You might have um, a question related to the topic that you're discussing. You could have handouts which you would place in Blackboard and then the students could access them there. You might use um, clickers, you might use Poll Everywhere. There's different uh, response tools that you can use. You'd have the students think and analyze about the question and integrate that information that you had shared in the handouts and then discuss and you'll decide does it make sense to have pairs do this? Does it make sense to have smaller groups? Maybe you want to use a smaller group because you want to make sure there's sense about this or maybe you want to make sure they have a variety of different perspectives or does it make sense for the instructor to lead this lead this for the, the whole class discussion or maybe the teaching assistant facilitates a discussion or maybe they facilitate a discussion in the um, recitation for the course or in the lab and then you explain there's an explanation of the question how they you know thought through and clarifying any information that they might still be confused about the the diagram it, it's simple and it's powerful 
because you know where you're going and you can it when you're in front of a class or if you're in an online class you can have this diagram and you can help it guide you through that whole process okay and now we would like to open it up for any questions that you all might have about the different strategies that we shared or questions about uh, your class. As I said, we're going to send uh, an email with some resources that will help you to be able to plan some of these things and think, think through how they might be appropriate for your class. Does anybody have any questions? Go ahead, Alicia. Um, I just, first of all, just thank you so very much. I feel like this was really useful. Um, I just had a quick question or would love to hear your experiences. Um, I think one of the things that came up in the active learning cheat sheet that you just presented is, of course, that, you know, sometimes these activities don't work quite as we expected or don't work as well in, in certain environments. I mean, in your experience, like how have you addressed that or, you know, have you addressed it with a class if you feel like it, it didn't work as well? Or do you just kind of move on to the next class and then reevaluate your use of that particular activity for the future? Um, just if you have any experience with it, I would just love to hear um, how other people have dealt with that. Well, one of the things I do is when I start the class, the, the first day of class, I'll explain to them that we're going to use different active learning techniques. We're going to be engaged in the process. There might be some techniques that they, they probably are, you're not familiar with them necessarily, but we're going to try them and we're going to learn from them and if if an activity doesn't go that well what what I would do is ask okay identify what what were the challenging aspects of of the activity and then ask the students okay you know I put this blackboard and you had the background information and we set up the groups and we did all this stuff but why why weren't you um, engaging? Why did you have the confusion at a certain point in this activity? And then they might say, well, the, you gave us um, the background information and you put us in groups, and, but we didn't know exactly what we were supposed to do in the group. We didn't know what the outcomes were supposed to be. So then I would say, okay, so that means that I need to give them some sort of a structure to guide their work. Day. But I would ask the students to help with that. Okay, go ahead, Alicia. Oh, no, that, that was very useful. Sorry, I still had my hand up, but that's, that's very useful. Okay, thank you. Um, Megan, was there something you wanted to add? Yeah, I, I think you and I are on the same page on this one. You know, a, a maybe failed attempt or a not entirely successful attempt is still better than no attempt at all. If, if something didn't uh, work out the way you anticipated for your uh, active learning activity or assessment, I think it's all about trying to isolate areas uh, that could be improved upon instead of just abandoning it altogether. Um, do you have a specific maybe project that didn't uh, go well or, or a specific concern? No, yeah, not and not anything specific. I, I just feel that sometimes with trying new activities, it can, I don't know, doesn't always go quite as you expected. And so <laughs> yeah. I, I just, which is fine and part of doing it. And I agree that it's better to try it. I just always, um, I think in that, you know, struggle with how much to have a class discussion about it. And you know, how to frame that discussion to, to learn from it. So I think some of these strategies are, are really helpful just from, from that, that sense. So thank you both. Yeah, I think also with, um, you know, these 
active learning activities, a, a common theme here is groups of students. Um, as much as we want to you know, instill this knowledge in our students, a lot of their learning um, happens amongst themselves. And, and so you know, a nice place to start, if, if you're not sure, is um, that just-in-time teaching um, strategy. You can give your students a, a question that they need to answer before they come to class, um, which is really nice because they have to put something on paper and, and give you a direct answer and submit it uh, to you. And so an example that I had of this was uh, one instructor said, well, why don't you um, take a look at this sample essay and they asked the students what grade does this deserve and so they had to come up with an answer and when the students got to class the the next period they were divided into groups and as a group they had to collectively agree upon a grade uh, they revisited the same question but as a group they they had to um, collaborate some of them had to um, change their answers and, and then they had to explain why they changed their answers uh, um, so you know if you're using groups or you're using active learning strategies in your class i, I think um, it's important to know why you're using it and and in what context if that makes sense that's a great summary megan of and, and why you're using it in the context aligns with that with that planning so that's that's a great wrap up there thank you oh i know we're about out of time um we can stick around if there are any other questions but otherwise um, we will be sending you a follow-up email with some additional resources and enjoy the rest of your afternoon thanks everybody perfect thank you so much really appreciate the engagement thank you thank you you're welcome Okay, okay, let's see. So we gotta wait.